Hi. My name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news, the gospel of truth, the gospel of our faith, the strong um, doctrines that are the basic concepts for uh, many believers. Um, now, normally, I would not be making a video tonight. I worked today and I can um, of course I'm tired I, I work afternoon shifts so I don't get home from work till around 11 o'clock at night but I get home I um, jump on YouTube and I check my notifications and um, there was a request from one of my subscribers who I see often watching my videos and um, thank you for that so um, there was a request for um, a video sharing, um, um, asking, uh, can you lose your salvation? Um, you know, things like, are, are, how do you know we're in the end times? How, how do we, um, how do we combat the darkness in the world, basically? Um, false teachers, how do we deal with that? So, Carol, um, I don't get many requests for Bible studies. I um, would not be making a video tonight if it hadn't been for that request um, because um, I usually make my videos when I'm off um, and then I'll upload them while I'm at work. So uh, I find that this is a very important, um, very important um, request and I'm seeing it too. I'm also seeing the darkness in the world. I'm seeing the false teachers. I'm seeing the complete bullying. And I'm here to encourage you that Jesus is coming soon. We're not long for this world. Uh, we, we are under a spiritual attack. Make no mistake. If you haven't um, run into anybody trying to belittle your faith or trying to push a false doctrine on you, then you're not in the battle yet. Um, as I said in my last um, video on blasphemy, if you're not feeling what's happening in the world, then you, you're, you might want to question. I mean, if you're not feeling the persecution or the contempt or the hatred or the division that we're seeing in the world today as Christians, then um, are you... Are you sharing the gospel? Are you completing God's word um, to go out into the world and share the gospel? Um, there is there is a lot of division in the church today. A lot. There are wolves among the sheep. Make no mistake. There are wolves among the sheep. Not everyone who's calling themselves a Christian and um, continuously going at you is actually a Christian. And that's the truth. Um, Satan has his um, minions out there, and they are they will do anything they can to tear you down. You know what one of Satan's most favorite, favorite tactics is? And I'm seeing this today. Now, I'm not saying that every person who says they're a Christian that doesn't agree with you is from Satan. This is not what I'm saying. Um, but you do need to be aware, and you need to know that they're out there. But uh, one of the tactics that I'm I'm personally seeing is give me just one verse. Just tell me one verse. Where in the Bible is the rapture? Give me the scripture. And um, the reason they do that is because they want to take individual verses and they want to rip them apart. Um, when, in all honesty, the gospel is found, um, the, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture is found throughout the Bible. And uh, it's a mystery that was um, unveiled. And if you're not a child of God, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to understand it. No matter how hard you try to tell, explain it to someone, they're not going to get it because it's veiled to them. Um, there's a reason the Bible was written the way it was. There's a reason the Holy Spirit is needed to understand the scriptures. Now, how do, why do I say that this is one of the tactics that Satan uses? Think back to the Garden of Eden. Did God really say 
this is a tactic, a scheme of Satan that worked in the past and um, people are still using it. If you feel the need to browbeat someone or force your opinion on someone or continuously harass them to the point, um, continuously, then you really need to stop and take a look at yourself and pray about it um, because it's not okay. And that is not what Jesus taught us to do. If we give the gospel, we give the message, and if they don't receive it, then we walk away. It's not our job to force someone to believe what you believe. It's not our job to force someone to believe the, to believe the gospel, to believe in the rapture, to believe in anything. We give them the information. The thing is, with a lot of these people, um, they already know the scriptures. They know them already. So let's say somebody posted a pre-rapture um, post and they've included all these scriptures in it and then you're in there just commenting, Amen, praise Jesus, can't wait to go home, thank you, you know, Amen, Maranatha. Somebody immediately jumps on that and give me one scripture, where does it say that? And they continue, and you tell, you tell them the scriptures that you have, you know, and what do they do next? They put up a, you know, three-page um, argument against it. And you go and tell them, so you give them more scriptures, and they break those apart, and they try to belittle you that way. They already have the scriptures. They already know what they are, and they already know what their plan of attack against you is going to be. So, just, you can tell them, hey, you, you've been given the scriptures, you choose to ignore them. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about scriptures that you already have. I'm not interested in your false teaching. I'm not going to change my mind. Nothing is going to make me change my mind. So just be aware um, of the tactics that they use to get you into an argument. And they try and they just, you know, pick at you and pick at you and pick at you. You know what else works really well? Blocking them. You'll find so much peace. I mean, yes, we are here to share the gospel. We are here to spread the word of God. But if they're not going to receive it, walk away. And you need to do that for your own peace of mind. You've done your part by telling them. God will do the rest. So the first um, misconception that I want to talk about, and this is where I'll be sharing the gospel, by the way, is um, where people are saying that, you know, once saved, always saved is a lie. You can lose your salvation if you don't live this way, if you don't. And that's what we're going to talk about. But that's where the gospel is also going to be shared because while I um, talk to you about this particular point, and I have many points to talk about, so stay with me if one of the topics isn't one that you're completely interested in, there's going to be other topics of things that I'm seeing today. So we're going to start with the truth about can a Christian be turned away from God? And I've shared this before, so this is from my old notes. So if you've seen some of my previous videos, you've probably already heard this message. But it has been a while. So, um, And like I said, I have other things that we're going to be discussing as well. But we're going to start with, can a Christian be turned away from God? Can we lose our salvation? And the answer to that is no. Absolutely not. God will never, ever abandon you or forsake you. He has promised us that if you believe that Jesus Christ is his son, that he came to earth as a baby, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that he rose again and will come back, that you will be saved. God does not lie. God does not break his promises. I have seen many posts in various groups over the years, and they're becoming more frequent, um, that say Christians will go to hell if this or that, or you're not saved unless you do this or that, or if you don't do these works or follow this law, or, or if you sin, you will not be saved. This is a false teaching. This is a lie to make Christians doubt the promises from God and question your faith, because if you lose faith and think your good deeds will save you, then Satan can try to turn you away from God. Yes, you can choose to leave God. We all have free will, but God will never, ever leave you. And that said, I want to add, um, true believers will not leave God. It is so much more than just faith and belief to us. It is knowledge 
we know God. We see him in our lives. We talk to him. He is known to us. We do not just suddenly change our minds. We may have struggles and we may go off on our own, but he is our good shepherd. And if we are lost, he finds us. Christians do not go to hell. A popular scripture often used to spread fear in Christians is Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's pretty scary, huh? So how do we reconcile, rec reconcile that? Um, I mean, that's scary. But no. Jesus is not telling Christians who believe in him and who love him and are faithful to him to depart. He is talking to the pretenders, to those who say they are Christians, but do not pray and do not believe in Jesus. In their hearts, they believe that good works will get them in. They are not children of God. They just tell people they are, but they never knew him. Jesus knows his sheep. He cannot be fooled. So what is the will of our Father? Well, John 6, 28 through 29 says, Then they said to him, What must we do to be sick? Or, I'm sorry, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. John 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, well, first, the term Christian must be defined. A Christian is not a person who has said a prayer or walk, uh, walked down an aisle um, or been raised in a Christian family. While each of these things can be part of a Christian experience, they are not what makes a Christian. A Christian is a person who has fully trusted in Jesus Christ as the only Savior and therefore possesses the Holy Spirit. John 3.16, Acts 16.31, Ephesians 2.8-9. So with this definition in mind, can a Christian lose salvation? It is a crucially important question. Um, perhaps the best way to answer it is to examine what the Bible says occurs at salvation and to study what losing salvation would entail. Um, a Christian is a new creature. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm sorry, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. A Christian is not simply an improved version of a person. A Christian is an entirely new creature. He is in Christ. For a Christian to lose salvation, a Christ, uh, the new creation would have to be destroyed. Um, a Christian is redeemed. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you um, from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 Now the word redeemed refers to a purchase being made, a price being paid. We were purchased at the cost of Christ's death. For a Christian to lose salvation, God himself would have to revoke his purpose of the um, his purchase of the individual for whom he paid um, with the precious blood of Christ. Um, a Christian is justified. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Lord through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. To justify is to declare righteous. All those who receive Jesus as Savior are declared righteous by God. For a Christian to lose salvation, God would have to go back on his word and undeclare what he had previously declared. Those absolved of guilt would have to be tried again and found guilty. God would have to reverse the sentence handed down from the divine bench. A Christian is promised eternal life. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Now eternal life is the promise of spending forever in heaven with God. God promises believe and you will have eternal life. For a Christian to lose salvation, eternal life would have to be redefined. The Christian is promised to live forever. Does eternal not mean eternal? A Christian is marked by God and sealed by the Spirit. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. Um, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. At the moment of faith, the new Christian is marked and sealed with the Spirit, who was promised to act as a deposit to guarantee the heavenly inheritance. The end result is that God's glory is praised. For a Christian to lose salvation, God would have to erase the mark, withdraw the Spirit, cancel the deposit, break his promise, revoke the guarantee, keep the inheritance, forego the praise, and lessen his glory. A Christian is guaranteed glorification. Those he predestined, predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, verse 30. According to Romans 5, 1, justification is ours at the moment of faith. According to Romans 8, 30, glorification comes with justification. All those whom God justifies are promised to be glorified. This promise will be fulfilled when Christians receive their perfect resurrection bodies in heaven. If a Christian can lose salvation, then Romans 8.30 is an error because God could not guarantee glorification for all those whom he predestines, calls, and justifies. No, a Christian cannot lose salvation. Most, if not all, of what the Bible says happens to us when we receive Christ would be invalidated if salvation could be lost. Salvation is a gift, a gift of God, and God's gifts are irrevocable. Romans eleven twenty nine. A Christian cannot be unnewly created. The redeemed cannot be unpurchased. Eternal life cannot be temporary. God cannot renege on his word. Scripture says that God cannot lie. Titus 1, verse 2. Two common objections to the belief that a Christian cannot lose salvation concern experiential ish issues. Number one, what about Christians who live a sinful, unrepent, um, unrepentant lifestyle? And number two, what about Christians who reject the faith and deny Christ? And the problem with these objections is the assumption that everyone who calls himself a Christian has actually been born again. The Bible declares that a true Christian will not live in a state of continual unrepentant sin. 1 John 3, verse 6. The Bible also says that anyone who departs um, the faith is demonstrating that he was never truly a Christian. 1 John 2, 19. He may have been religious. He may have put on a good show, but he was never born again by the power of God. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Matthew 7, 16. The redeemed of God belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may um, bear fruit for God. Romans 7, 4. Nothing can separate a child of God from the Father's love. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Nothing can remove a Christian from God's hand. John 10, 28 through 29. God guarantees eternal life maintain, um, and maintains the salvation he has given us. The good um, shepherd searches for the lost sheep, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Luke 15, 5 through 6. The lamb is found, and the shepherd gladly bears the burden. Our Lord takes full responsibility for bringing the lost one safely home. Jude 24 through 25 further emphasizes the goodness and faithfulness of our Savior. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You can never lose your salvation. 
you have been um, severed from um, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Galatians five verse four. Hmm, fallen from grace. Well, that certainly sounds like they lost their salvation. Um, and the way the term is popularly used today doesn't help either. When we hear in the news about a celebrity who has fallen from grace, it typically describes someone who was behaving well but then suffered a moral failure. Perhaps they were arrested for illegal drugs, cheated on their spouse, or cheated on their taxes. But in Galatians, falling from grace means something very different. Falling away from the message of God's grace and toward the law. Paul wrote Galatians to a variety of people. Some had accepted the gospel. Others were acquainted with the message but hadn't accepted it. And still others had flirted with the idea of salvation by grace through faith, but instead chose to seek rightness with God through keeping the law. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul was speaking to those seeking to be justified by the law. Um, in verse 4, and notes that they were planning to receive circumcision. Verse 3, clearly this means they were unbelievers who had no clue how to get right with God. How can, um, so how can we be certain that Paul was not speaking to believers who had lost their salvation? Notice the contrast between you and we in the passage. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace, for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Galatians 5, 4 through 5. So the Greek word for severed here conveys that some of the Galatians were void of Christ. In other words, those who seek rightness with God through law keeping inevitably cut themselves off from the truth, um, from the truth of the gospel. This makes it impossible for them to be justified before God. So this is not a group of believers who have lost salvation. Instead, it's a group of Galatians influenced and ultimately persuaded by um, due desires to mix Old Testament rule keeping in with their true salvation message. This is why Paul separates himself and his fellow believers, we, as those in Christ who approach rightness with God in a different way, by faith, not by the works of the law. Now, the New Testament is full of evidence that we cannot lose our salvation. Jesus said that the new life we have is eternal, not temporal, and we will never die. Luke 20, 36. He said that no one can snatch us out of his hand. John 10, 28 through 29. Paul tells us that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, and that our calling will never be revoked in Romans 11, verse 29. God will never leave us and never forsake us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. We are protected by his power. 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. God is able to save us completely because he always lives to intercede for us. Um, any sins imaginable. Hebrews 7, 25. Why did Jesus so confidently say that everyone the Father has given him, he will lose no one in John 3, I mean John 6, verse 39? Because it's not our dedication, our commitment, or our promise keeping that maintains our salvation. No. Um, the book of Hebrews actually reveals the polar opposite. It's, God prom um, it's God's promise to himself that secures our salvation. Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. The author of Hebrews speaks of a promise secured between two unchangeable things that anchor our souls. And what are these two unchangeable things? God and God. Yeah, as hard as that is to understand. Um, in the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the, to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of, of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. It's impossible for God and God to lie. So when God promises God, you can count on it. And that's the whole point. Our salvation is anchored to a promise that God made to himself. 
since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Hebrews 6, 13. God won't deny himself or you. Some of our most frequent spiritual questions relate to the loss of salvation. But what if I die by suicide? But what if I get a divorce and then remarry? But what if I commit the same sin willfully over and over again? These four words pastor us. But what if I... However, God already saw our concerns coming. He dealt with them entirely through the new covenant by anchoring us to a promise that he made to himself. We don't maintain or sustain any part of God's promise to himself. As believers who are forever in Christ, the but what if questions don't have to plague us. We are not even in the, in the equation. Instead of asking, but what if I, we need to be asking, but what if God? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. God did the very thing he needed to do to secure us forever. He promised himself that he would never leave us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. God placed his spirit in us. He cannot disown himself, so he will never disown us. That was part um, that was all part of God's perfect plan to secure us forever in Jesus. And it's this security um, in Jesus that inspires and motivates us to live uprightly. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Now, just one more thing I want to talk to you about real quick before I move on a little bit here. But Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, have you noticed what they're not saying? I mean, we see what they're saying. Haven't I done this? Haven't I done that? Didn't we do this? We did it all in your name. Haven't we done these things? What they're not saying is, but Lord, didn't you die on the cross for my sins? Didn't your precious blood spilt for, um, spilt for me, cover me, and wash my sins white as snow? Lord, didn't you promise that if I believed in you and put my faith and my trust in you that I would be saved? That's not what they're saying here. These are not Christians that he's turning away. I know what I would say. But Jesus, I put my faith and my trust in you. I believed in you. You did it all. You finished it at the cross. Your blood has cleansed me. That's what I would say. That's not what those people are saying. And you need to realize that. Satan likes to use that against you. But if you know your scriptures and you understand... Um, and you, you really look at them and study them, you'll find that you are you are secure. Jesus holds you in the palm of his hands. Let's look at some what some more of the scriptures say. Um, John 10, 28 through 29. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. 1 John 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that no one, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 25 who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2.8-10 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Romans 5, verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Sanctified by faith in me. John 6, 28 through 29. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So, that's just crazy. But Romans 8, 1 through 17, it's all here. It's all here in the Bible. And there's many, many scriptures. I'm going to give you this last one, um, and then we're going to move on a little bit here. But Romans 8, 1 through 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires the mind governed by the flesh is death but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to, subject to death, because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Do not fear. Trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, we are saved through faith by grace. This is a gift from God, so it wouldn't be much of a gift if he just snatched it away every time we messed up, would it? <sighs> no. Now, Christians today are equally eagerly like I said I worked today so I'm kind of stumbling a little bit on speaking but this is a very important topic so Christians today are very eager, eagerly watching and waiting for our Lord and Savior to call us out of this world to meet him in the clouds we see the world around us we see all the signs converging every day there are jaw-dropping events pointing to the rapture the tribulation, and the return of our Lord and Savior. We are so excited and we know he's coming. Many believe that um, that the Feast of Trumpets is an extremely high watch time. Um, it's a real possibility. But right now I'm looking closer at um, this summer, July, New Wine, um, which possibly is sometime towards the end of July but um, I'm watching every day because the rapture is imminent and the Feast of Trumpets is going to be coming up in a few months so for those of you who believe that that's the day it's a possibility um, but I'm convinced that Jesus will be catching us up in the clouds right now 
while we're waiting, we are still occupying the earth and we need to share the gospel and plant the seeds to bring others to Jesus. Um, and if Jesus tarries and we have to wait a little bit longer than we thought, rejoice in the extra time that we have to rescue our loved ones from Satan's greedy little fingers because the time is the time is now. The time is soon. Jesus is coming, man. Like he, tonight, tomorrow, he's coming. And he's coming very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, uh, 1 Corinthians. Let's see here. Uh, I forget the. Well, in 1 Corinthians, I forget the chapter, but verse 51 through 54. Just one second. I need to actually look it up. Wow. Sorry about that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 54. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? Um, so that's right at that moment we get our glorified bodies. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, now I'm going to tell you, I believe that the rapture very well, um, I'm expecting it any day now. I'm not actually thinking that we're going to have to stay and wait for the peace, peace of trumpets, but this is the big, a big, a big um, time where people watch. Although, looking at the world around us today, you need to be watching now. But I will say that um, at the Feast of Trumpets, um, Israel is blowing the trumpets a hundred times with the last trump being the longest. This feast is known as the feast that no man knows the day or hour. Because every year this feast is celebrated, um, um, they have to actually see the small... It's, it's at the new moon and the very first tiny sliver of the new moon. Um, so that's why they don't know the day or the hour. And you have to have two witnesses that have to actually see this. But um, as I said, if we remain here that long, that's not that long. September, fall. I mean, it's July right now. July, August, September, October. That's still just a few months. But as I said, I, I, I'll be surprised if we're still here then. I think he's coming and he's coming soon. Um, he's going to come at his perfect appointed moment. And until then, we occupy, we complete the work of our Father in Heaven um, that our Father in Heaven has given us. He is coming soon, so don't get caught up in dates. But know that we are running out of time to warn the lost. Um, the rapture and the second coming of Christ are often confused. Sometimes it's difficult to determine whether a scripture verse is referring to the rapture or the second coming. However, I'm not confused at all. Um, once you realize the difference between the two, it's really hard to change your mind and go back to blinding yourself. Although some claim that they used to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture and they've changed their minds. Once this is revealed to you from the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit actually has opened your eyes and you've seen this and you're, you're not going to, you start seeing it everywhere all throughout scripture. Um, it, 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 it's very obvious so those who say, oh, I used to believe that, but I've changed my mind. Well, you lost your faith is what happened. Um, you never really believed it. So um, stu um, in studying the end, end times Bible prophecy, it's really important to differ differentiate between the two. 
the rapture is when Jesus Christ returns to remove the church. Um, that's all believers in Christ from the earth. And I also believe that the children under the age of accountability will be leaving as well. Um, the rapture is, is described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. Um, believers who have died will have will have have their bodies resurrected. Um, those who have already died, their bodies will be resurrected. And along with believers who are still living, together we will meet the Lord in the air. This will all occur in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The second coming is when Jesus returns to defeat the Antichrist, destroy evil, establish his millennial kingdom. The second coming is described in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. The important differences between the rapture and the second coming are... Um, well, I've got a list here. So as follows. Um, number one, at the rapture, believers meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 At the second coming, believers return with the Lord to the earth. Revelation 19.14 Now that said, you got to realize, at the rapture, Jesus calls up. He doesn't come to the earth. It's not a second coming. He's not coming to the earth. We are leaving the earth and going to him. He's calling us up to meet him. And at the second coming, we are coming back with him. And then he does come to the earth, which is his second coming to the earth. The second coming um, occurs after the great and terrible tribulation. Uh, Revelations chapter 6 through 19. And the rapture occurs before the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9. Revelation uh, chapter, chapter 3 verse 10. Um, and honestly, once this is opened up to you, you'll start seeing scriptures all over the place. You'll understand. But the rapture occurs before the tribulation. And the rapture is the removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 and 5, verse 9. The second coming includes the removal of unbelievers as an act of judgment. Matthew 24, 40 through 41. The rapture will be... Now, people like to say secret... Um, in a way it is um, it will be a surprise to those who are not watching and not ready um, but the rapture actually isn't a secret it's just that nobody's going to know when exactly it's going to happen um, and it'll be instantaneous 1 Corinthians 15 50-54 but the second coming will be visible to everyone. Revelation 1, 7, Matthew 24, 29 through 30. Now I've had people argue that, oh, you know, he's coming with a shout, with the trumpet of God. Um, so everyone's going to know it's not a secret. It's not a quiet vanishing. The only people who are going to hear that call are the children of God that he's calling up. I, I mean, I think. Um, but the moment it happens... There's going to be a lot of shocked people left behind. Uh, the second coming of Christ will not occur until after certain other end time events take place. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse four, Matthew twenty four fifteen through thirty, Revelation chapter six through eighteen. The rapture is imminent and it could take place at any moment. Titus chapter two verse thirteen, First Thessalonians chapter four thirteen through eighteen, First Corinthians chapter fifteen verses fifty through four. Um, so. Why is it important to keep the rapture and the second coming distinct? I mean, if the rapture and the second coming are the same event, believers will have to go through the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, Revelation 3.10. Uh, if the rapture and the second coming are the same event, the return of Christ is not imminent. There are many things that would have to occur before he can return. Matthew 24, 4-30. Um, in describing the tribulation period, Revelations chapter 6 through 19 Nowhere mentions the church. During the tribulation, also called the time of trouble for Jacob, Jeremiah 30 through uh, 30 verse 7, um, God will again turn his primary attention to Israel. The rapture and the second coming are similar but separate events. Both involve Jesus returning. Uh, the rapture and second coming, um, both I mean, they're both end time events. However, it's crucially important to recognize the differences. Um, the rapture is the return of Christ in the clouds to remove all believers from the earth before the time of God's wrath. And the second coming is the return of Christ to the earth to bring the tribulation to an end and to defeat the Antichrist and his evil empire. Um, I had another... Okay, so 
like I said, I kind of impromptu is talking to you about these subjects tonight. Um, but I wanted to tell you also, Revelation tells us that we're going to be before the throne of God at the time when Jesus opens the seven seals. We're not going to see any of the tribulation. We're going to be there. And how do I know? So Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Bear with me here. Um, I do plan to make a video, and I'm prepared to make a video um, that I want to put up soon about the lampstands in the Bible, biblically speaking, um, the lampstands in the Bible. But this is going to go along with what I'm saying now. So Revelation 1, 12 through 13 then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. So this is John, and he's on earth. This is chapter one of Revelation. He has he is on earth and he um, he, he turns and he sees a voice that was speaking to him. He heard a voice and he turned and he saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. Now, Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 tells us, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So mark these verses. Revelation 1, 20. John is on earth. He sees the lampstands. And then in Revelation 1, verse 20. I'm sorry, Revelation 1, 12 through 13. John is on earth. He sees the, the, the lampstands. A Revelation 120 tells us the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, Revelation 4 1, that's where it gets interesting. John is called up to heaven. Revelation 4 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So there's a voice, like a trumpet, that says, Come up here. This is the rapture. And I will, sorry, and I will show you what must take place after this. After what? Verses 1 through 3 are the letters to the churches. So after, after this is after the church, church age. What happens next? After the age of grace, after the churches are raptured, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this, after the church age. So Revelation 4.1. And then what happens? What does John see when he is in heaven? Revelation 4.5. The first thing he sees is the throne of God. From the, um, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. That's Revelation 4, 5. So the rapture happens. So first, John is on earth. He sees the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. He's called up to heaven. And what does he see at the throne? The seven lamps blazing. The seven lampstands, the churches. We are there. We are there before Jesus opens the seals. Um, and I'm not going to be going further into that because I have a lot of, I mean, I have another um, video I planned. I hadn't planned this one, but I did want to include that in the study on, in this study. Um, but because it's very, it's very clear. We are there before the seven seals are opened, before the um, time of Jacob's trouble. And we're going to discuss that. Um, so very clear. We're, gonna, we're not just talking about the rapture in this video. We're talking about many doctrines that are under attack. So <clears throat> keep in mind, um, at the rapture, Jesus will return for his saints. At the second coming, he will return with his saints. At the rapture, Jesus will not descend to earth. At the second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives as a prelude to his earthly reign. 
At the rapture, Jesus will bring a blessing for his saints. At the second coming, he will bring judgment for those who have rejected him. The rapture could occur at any moment. The second coming will occur seven years later. You can pretty much count the days, especially when the, um, the Antichrist sits himself in the throne of the temple and calls himself God. Then you know you've got, what is it, 1,200 and, or 1,200... 40, 60, I mean, it's it's exact. I might even have it in my notes here. Um, but you'll be able to count it to the day. Um, when the rapture occurs, Christ will take every deceased and living Christian to heaven with him. Paul describes this glorious event in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. There's another verse that you really need to consider. And um, I, don't, I don't have it exactly here, but you'll recognize. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you onto me. Why would Jesus need to go to heaven to prepare a place for us and receive us to him if we weren't going to be going to heaven? Because when Jesus returns, he's coming to the earth and he's gonna, we're going to be here with him for a thousand years on earth. After that, I believe that's when um, you know New Jerusalem comes down. We would not need, Jesus would not need to prepare a place for us in his father's house if we weren't going there. That home that he's preparing is for the raptured saints and those dead in Christ. The rapture will protect God's saints from the tribulation. The seven years of judgment that will be poured out on earth between the rapture and the second coming. Um, there are some who argue the tribulation period will begin before the rapture. However, the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 which suggests that the church will not experience God's judgment during the tribulation. Seven years after the rapture, Jesus will return to earth in the event known as the second coming. His return will be entirely different from his arrival in Bethlehem as a humble child. When Christ returns, he will appear as the exalted king of the universe, surrounded by his saints. The powers of evil will quickly be defeated. <sighs> and I'm sorry, I told you I worked today, I'm tired. Um, but they'll quickly be defeated, and that'll be at the Battle of Armageddon. And then Christ will establish his everlasting kingdom on earth. So the tribulation is a future seven-year period when God will um, finish his discipline of Israel and finalize his judgment of an unbelieving world. The church, comprised of all who have trusted in the person and work of the Lord Jesus, will not be present during the tribulation. The church will be removed from the earth in an event called the rapture, the harpazo, the catching away, the great banishing. In this way, the church is saved from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. So, another thing that people are arguing about is the tribulation. Seven years? Three and a half years? Is it now? Has it already happened? Throughout scripture, the tribulation is associated with the day of the Lord, um, that time during which God personally intervenes in history to accomplish his plan. It is referred to as tribulation in the latter days, the great tribulation, which refers to, I mean, let's see. Well, okay, so see, um, look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 13, 6 through 9, Joel, chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 2, 1 through 31, uh, Joel, chapter 3, verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. Um, and it is referred as tribulation, or in the latter days, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 30. Um, the Great Tribulation uh, refers to the more intense second half of the, second, um, of the seven year period, Matthew 24, 21. A time of distress in Daniel 12, verse 1, and the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, 
And we have this description of the tribulation that attends the day of the Lord. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, that day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry. So the tribulation will be marked by various divine judgments, celestial disturbances, natural disasters, and terrible plagues. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 16. Um, in his mercy, God sets a limit on the duration of the tribulation. As Jesus said, those will be the days of distress unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. Mark 13, 19 through 20. Um, Daniel 9, 24 through 27 reveals the purpose and time of the tribulation. This passage speaks of 70 weeks that have been declared against your people. Daniel's people are the Jews, the nation of Israel. And Daniel 9, 24 speaks of a period of time in which God's purpose is to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. God declares that 77s will fulfill all these things. The sevens are groups of years, so 77s is 490 years. Uh, some translations refer to 70 weeks of years. Now in Daniel 9, 25 and 26, the Messiah will be cut off after seven sevens and 62 sevens. That's 69 total sevens, beginning with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. In other words, 69 sevens, 483 years. After the decree to rebuild is issued, the Messiah will die. Biblical historians confirm that 483 years passed from the time of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the time when Jesus was crucified. Most Christian scholars, regardless of their views of eschatology, have the above um, that understanding of Daniel's 70s, 77s. Now, God said that 70 weeks had been determined, 490 years, but with the death of the Messiah, we have only 69 weeks accounted for. That's 483 years. This leaves one seven-year period to be fulfilled, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9, 24. This final seven-year period is what we call the tribulation, the time when God finishes judging Israel and brings them back to himself. Daniel 9, 27 gives a few highlights of the final week, the seven-year tribulation period. A ruler will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Jesus refers to this passage in Matthew 24, verse 15. The ruler who confirms the covenant and then sets up the abomination is called the beast in Revelation 13. According to Daniel 9, 27, the beast's covenant will be for seven years, but in the middle of this week, three and a half years into the tribulation, the beast will break the covenant, putting a stop to the Jewish sacrifices. Revelation 13 explains that the beast will place an image of himself in the temple and require the world to worship him. Revelation 13, 5 says that this will go on for 42 months, um, which is three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. So we see a covenant lasting to the middle of the week, uh, Daniel 9, 27, and the beast who made the covenant demanding worship for 42 months, Revelation 13, 5. Therefore, the total length of time is 84 months or seven years. We also have a reference to the last half of the tribulation in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. There the ruler will oppress God's people for a time, times, and half a time. A time is one year. Times is two years. Half a time is half a year. A total of three and a half years. This time of oppression against the Jews is also described in Revelation 13, 5 through 7, and is part of the Great Tribulation, the latter half of the seven-year tribulation, when the beast or the Antichrist will be in power. Now, 
A further reference to the timing of events in the tribulation is found in Revelation 11, 2 through 3, which speaks of 1,260 days and 42 months, both equaling three and a half years, using the prophetic year of 360 days. Also, Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 through 12, speaks of 1,290 days and 1,335 days from the midpoint of the tribulation. In additional days in Daniel 12 uh, may include time after the tribulation for the judgment of the nations. Now Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and time for setting up of Christ's millennial kingdom in Revelation 24 through 6. So in summary, the tribulation is the seven-year period in the end times in which humanity's decadence and depravity will reach its fullness, with God judging accordingly. Also during that time, Israel will repent of their sin and receive Jesus as their Messiah, setting up a time of great blessing and restoration. Uh, read Zephaniah chapter 3, 9 through 20, and Isaiah chapter 12, uh, verse 35. The tribulation saints um, are quite simply saints living during the tribulation. They missed the rapture. They were left behind, and they came to Jesus after. Um, I absolutely believe that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. I will not change my mind on that. But the Bible indicates that a great number of people during the tribulation will place their faith in Jesus Christ. In his vision of heaven, John sees a vast number of these tribulation saints who have been martyred by the Antichrist. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. When John asks who they are, he is told these are they who have come out of the great tribul. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's verse 14. The tribulation will be a time of great trouble for the wicked, because of God's judgments. It will also be a time of great persecution for the believers or saints, because of the Antichrist's persecution. Revelation 13 verse 7. Um, Daniel saw the Antichrist waging war against the saints and defeating them. Daniel 7, 21. Of course, the saints' eternal salvation is secure. Daniel also saw that the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7, 22, and Revelation 14, 12 through 13. The tribulation saints will hear the gospel from several possible sources. The first is the Bible. Um, there will be many copies of the Bible left in the world. And when God's judgments begin to fall, many people will likely react by finding a Bible to see if prophecies are being fulfilled. Many of the tribulation saints will also have heard the gospel from those witnesses. Revelation, um, from the two witnesses, Revelation 11, 1 through 13. The Bible says these two individuals will prophesy for 1,260 days, three and a half years. Verse 3. And perform great miracles. Verse 6. And um, also there are the 144,000 Jewish missionaries who are redeemed and sealed by God during the tribulation. Uh, Revelation 7, 1 through 8. And immediately following the description of their sealing in Revelation 7, we read of the multitudes of tribulation saints who are saved from every corner of the world. That's verses 9 through 17. So, the tribulation saints will serve their Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of desperate surroundings. Faithful to the end, many of these believers will die for their faith, but in their death they overcome. They overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Revelation 12 verse 11, and God will reward them. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7, 15-17 We praise the Lord that the great day of trouble will also be a great day of grace. Even as God is meeting out his punishment on an unbelieving world, 
He will be restoring Israel to faith and extending grace to all who believe, both Jew and Gentile. God has always been in the business of saving people, and that salvation will still be available during the tribulation. But don't wait until then. Um, you don't want to be here for that. Receive Jesus now. John chapter 1, verse 12. So, I mean, some Bible interpreters believe that there will be absolutely no chance for salvation after the rapture. However, there is no place in the Bible that says this, or even hints at it. There will be many people who come to Christ during the tribulation. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses are Jewish believers. If no one can come to Christ during the tribulation, then why are people being beheaded for their faith? Revelation 20, verse 4. No passage of scripture argues against people having a chance to be saved after the rapture. Many passages indicate the opposite. And another view is those that hear the gospel and reject it before the rapture cannot be saved. Those saved during the tribulation, then, are those who had never heard the gospel before the rapture. Um, the proof text for this view is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9-11, through 11, which says that the Antichrist will work miracles to deceive those who are perishing, and that God himself will send them a powerful delusion to confirm them in their unbelief. The reason given is that they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 10. And granted, those who are hard-hearted, toward the gospel before the rapture are likely to remain so. And the Antichrist will deceive many, Matthew 24, 5. But those who refuse to love the truth does not necessarily refer to people who heard the gospel before the rapture. It could be anyone who wholly rejects God's salvation at any time. So there is no clear scriptural evidence to support this view. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 speaks of those martyred during the tribulation because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained these martyrs will correctly interpret what they see during the tribulation and will believe the gospel themselves and call on others to repent and believe as well. The Antichrist and his followers will not tolerate their evangelism and will kill them. All of these martyrs are people who were alive before the rapture, but who were not believers until afterwards. Therefore, there, there must be an opportunity to come to Christ in faith after the rapture, which is why every seed that you plant is it's so important that you're planting those seeds. You may not see the results, but God does. And you may save someone's soul after the rapture. Um, so let's look at Second Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people. There are wolves among the sheep. Make no mistake. Not everyone out there is actually a Christian. Just because they say they are doesn't make them one. Second Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, pulling them, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of lawlessness, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings, yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for harm, um, with harm for the harm they have done. 
their idea of pleasure is to cross in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of idolatry, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bazar, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For thy mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by slaves to, I mean, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having the ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Re we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Um, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, to be spiritually blind is not to see Christ. And not to see Christ is not to see God. Colossians 1, 15 through 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Spiritual blindness is a grievous condition experienced by those who do not believe in God. Um, Jesus Christ and his word. Romans chapter 2, uh, verse 8 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12 those who reject Christ are the lost John 6 68 through 69 uh, being spiritually blind they are perishing 2 Corinthians 4 3 through 4 Revelation 3 17 they chose not to accept the teachings of Christ and his authority in their lives Matthew 28 18 um, they are blind to the manifestations of God as revealed through his word and Jesus Christ uh, John chapter 1 verse 1, Acts 28, 26 through 27. They are described as those who do not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. So Peter spoke of such people as scoffers, who will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3. And um, see also Proverbs chapter 21, verse 24, and Jude chapter 1, verse 18. Those who reject Christ and his word are spiritually blind and cannot understand the truth of the gospels, of the scriptures. The truth sounds foolish to them. Isaiah 37, 23, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The Bible describes those denying God as fools. Um, because of their blindness and rejection of God and his word, they are in a perilous, unsaved condition. So the spiritually blind are simply unable to understand God's word. So if you find yourself beating your head into a brick wall trying to explain it to someone who just doesn't get it, even with the scriptures right there in front of them, the, um, you're, you're probably wasting your time because the spiritually blind are simply unable to understand God's word. Matthew 13, 13. Deuteronomy 29, 4. Jesus said, 
If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 15 through 17. Paul echoed this when he told the believers in Rome, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Romans 8, 8 through 9. Um, those outside of Christ are not of God because their lives are steeped in the things of the world with all its passions, their eyes blind to the Spirit of God. The Apostle John said, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, but that person's love is from the world. 1 John two fifteen through 16 Now the cause of spiritual blindness is made quite clear in the Scriptures. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, Paul refers to Satan as the God of this world. Extraordinarily evil. Um, John eight forty four. Satan destroys the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And is the cause of all temptations. Luke chapter 4, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. He reveals, um, he revels in scheming um, against and trapping the unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 11, verse 11, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. Satan's goal is to devour the weak who fall prey to temptation, fear, loneliness, worry, depression, persecution. 1 Peter 5, 8-9. I'm giving you the scriptures. So don't tell me I haven't given you the scriptures. I'm giving them to you. Um, without God and left to ourselves, we easily succumb to the devil's schemes. We can become so mired in the affairs of this world and its moral darkness that in the end, God turns us over to spiritual blindness and eternal condemnation. John 4, 12 verse 40 Romans chapter 1 24 through 32 as believers we have the spirit of God reigning um, in our lives to ward off the debilitating effects of Satan's power and the world's influence first John 4 13 John tells us <coughs> whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God God abides in him and he is in God first John 4 15 Satan wars within and without us. His weapons are deceitful and crafty schemes to make us doubt and stumble. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Yet God has provided us with powerful weapons to ward off his flaming arrows. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. As believers, we can overcome the evil one and remain in the light and never become spiritually blind. For in truth, Jesus has given us his wonderful promise. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. Spiritual darkness is the state of a person who is living apart from God. The Old Testament book of Isaiah, in prophesying of the Messiah, speaks of a deep spiritual darkness that enveloped the people. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. This passage reappears in the New Testament in Matthew 4, 16, to announce that those who have come to know the God of Israel through his son, Jesus Christ, are the ones who have been delivered from the spiritual darkness and now walk in the light of God's life. The Apostle John taught that God is light. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness, we are not practicing the truth. 1 John 1, 5 through 6. And Jesus declared that he is the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. So spiritual darkness means not having fellowship with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
The darkness of separation from God is overcome through Christ. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, verse 4 through 5. From the moment um, Adam and Eve sinned, humans have lived in a fallen world. All people are born in a fallen state of sin and separation from God. Until a person is reborn of God's spirit, he or she lives in spiritual darkness. Sin darkens our understanding and destroys our spiritual sight, cloaking us in deep darkness. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 19. Moses compares this state of sin and disobedience to groping about like a blind person in the dark. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, 28, verse 29. One of Job's friends speaks of those who are lost in spiritual darkness. Darkness comes upon them in the daytime. At noon, they grope as in the night. Job uh, chapter 5, verse 14. So living in rebellion to God and his will is equivalent to living in spiritual darkness. When the Lord commissioned Paul, he said, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Acts chapter 26. Um, verses 17 through 18. Um, so after salvation, believers become beacons of the spiritual light of Christ. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. Those who are in Jesus Christ have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Those who reject Jesus um, face eternal separation from God in blackest darkness. Jude chapter 1 4 through 13. Now, in, Juda um, in Judaism, a person's inner character and moral quality are understood to be reflected through the eyes. In Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 23, Jesus compares the moral condition of an unregenerate soul to darkness. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus' listeners would have understood that a healthy eye is one that lets in light, just as a healthy, regenerate heart lets in spiritual light. But a sick or sinful eye or heart shuts out light, leaving the soul in spiritual darkness. Um, the Apostle Paul describes those in a sinful state um, before knowing Christ as possessing a darkened, closed mind and a hardened heart. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18. Unbelievers live in spiritual darkness because Satan, the god of this world, has blinded their minds. They cannot see the glorious light of the gospel. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see this glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Um, spiritual darkness refers to all that is in opposition to the light of God's love in Christ. The good news that Jesus brings to this world is that his light, his life-giving spirit, floods light and life into the spiritual darkness of the sinner's heart. The one who opened the eyes of the blind can also bring us out of spiritual darkness. No matter how deep the darkness, the light of God's love and truth overcomes every sin that separates us from God. God gave us the Bible to teach us about him and his ways. And since God is not a God of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14.33, any and all confusion must come from the destructive forces of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world refers to the ungodly world system and its people who do not understand or care about the word of God. The flesh is the lingering sinful nature Christians, um, Christians possess that corrupts their godly walk. And the devil refers to Satan and his demons who twist God's word, often while masquerading as angels of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15 Each of these forces 
can act individually or in unison in an attempt to confuse people about the Word of God. But most confusion results from our own laziness and false teaching. Ultimately, and most tragically, confusion about the Bible can lead to a false hope of salvation. And that is Satan's ultimate goal. When Satan tempted Jesus, he used misinterpretations of the Word of God for his attacks. Satan does the same thing today, taking a truth of Scripture and misapplying it. Satan is skilled at twisting the Word of God just enough so that it produces disastrous consequences while still sounding like the Word of God. And sometimes confusion over what the Bible teaches originates from poor Bible translations or even intentionally distorted translations. More often, though, confusion results from lack of serious study among believers and the false preachers, teachers, and writers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 13. Um, so these, these false preachers, teachers, writers, um, they can be found on the radio, television, the internet, in random groups. It could be a Christian just putting out their point of view. These false prophets uh, take even proper translations and through both ignorance and by design twist and distort the word of God to promote their own agenda or appeal to the thinking of the world. Instead of lazy Bible study and relying on others to teach us the word of God, we should study God's word diligently and rely on the Holy Spirit. He will open the heart to God's truth concerning himself and his creation, prayer, worship, Christian love, our battle with Satan, personal conduct, church conduct, and achieving a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, most deadly confusion is rampant regarding the truth of the gospel. While scripture teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Today, um, Many who call themselves evangelistic Christians believe that heaven can be gained by other ways and other religions. But in spite of apparent confusion, the sheep will still hear the voice of the shepherd and will follow only him. John chapter 10, verse 27. Those who do not belong to the shepherd will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap up teachers to themselves according to their own lusts, tickling the ear. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. God has given us his spirit and the command to preach biblical truth with humility and patience in and out of season, 2 Timothy 4.2, and to study to show ourselves approved. Workers who correctly handle the word of truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, until the Lord uh, Jesus returns and puts an end to all their confusion. The phrase, the God of this world or God of this age, indicates that Satan is the major influence on the ideals, opinions, goals, hopes, and views of the majority of people. His influence also encompasses the world's philosophies, education, and commerce. The thoughts, ideas, speculations, and false religions of the world are under his control and have sprung from his lies and deceptions. Satan is also called the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he is the ruler of this world. In John 12, 31, these titles and many more signify Satan's capabilities. To say, for example, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air is to signify that in some way he rules over the world and the people in it. This is not to say that he rules the world completely. God is still sovereign, but it does mean that God in his infinite wisdom has allowed Satan to operate in this world within the boundaries God has set for him. When the Bible says Satan has power over the world, we must remember that God has given him domain over unbelievers only. Believers are no longer under the rule of Satan. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Unbelievers, on the other hand, are caught in the snare of the devil. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26. They lie in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5 19. And are in bondage to Satan. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. Oh. I did just take a break. You probably can tell if my screen's moved at all. Um, sorry. I do have blood clots and I do have to get up every once in a while and walk um, for an hour and a half into this um, study. And trust me, it's just getting good. So if you stayed with me this long, thank you so much. Um, we're going to continue. There is a reason that um, your gospel message isn't reaching the ears or they just don't hear. We say all the time, how can they not know? It's right there. 
And it's mind boggling to us that um, unbelievers or even fellow Christians just can't see the truth that is right there in the scriptures. But as I said, not everyone has the spirit, the Holy Ghost guiding them. And once you've had the truth revealed to you, it's, you cannot, you, you, you just can't go back. You've seen it and it becomes apparent in all the scriptures. Um, so when the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world, it is not saying that he has ultimate authority. It is conveying the idea that Satan rules over the unbelieving world in a specific way. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the unbeliever follows Satan's agenda. The God in this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Satan's scheme includes promoting false philosophies in the world, philosophies that blind the unbeliever to the truth of the gospel. Satan's philosophies are the fortress in which people are imprisoned and they must be set free by Christ. Um... Here's one example is when they, I've already given this, um, some of these examples, but people who are, I mean, that do not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, that's not a salvational issue, but how angry they get at you. They bully you. They, um, they, they do not stop. They, they will not just, you know, shake the dust off their boots and walk on. No, they are try to bully you into their way of thinking you give them the scriptures and they say give me a scripture you've already given them the scripture they break it down and say oh that does not say anything about the rapture you need to take the whole of God's word not just one verse here and one verse there it's not you know picking and choosing um, the Bible's clear and those of us who have the Holy Spirit um, can see it throughout the scriptures that it's very biblical um but you don't see us getting angry and harassing people who don't share the same view satan does not like the pre-tribulation rapture he does not like that jesus has um has forgiven us and that he's going to remove us from the earth when satan has his full reign he doesn't like that and another example of um of false philosophy is the belief that man can earn God's favor by doing certain acts um, like having to persevere and die during the tribulation having to endure the tribu seven year tribulation in almost every false religion I mean I mean that is that is um, a slap in the face to Jesus to say that you have to go through seven years of tribulation is to say that you have to earn your way um, Meriting God's favor or earning eternal life is a predominant theme. It's used often. Earning salvation by works, however, is contrary to biblical um, revelation. Man cannot work to earn God's favor. Eternal life is a free gift. See Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. And that free gift is available through Jesus Christ and him alone. John three sixteen, John 14, verse 6. No good deeds you do will ever be good enough. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We all make mistakes. And that's another thing. People will, um, they will, if they if they feel like they're losing an argument, they will personally attack you. I've been redeemed. My sins are forgiven. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Do I still sin? I do. Um, but Satan is the accuser. And if he can find even a scrap of evidence of something that you've done wrong or are doing wrong, he will use that against you. And that's why you'll see someone losing an argument about like the pre-tribulation rapture, for example, and they will turn it as a and go on a personal attack against you. It changes the subject completely from the topic that you're discussing. Um, and it's one of Satan's ways to shame you. But I don't live in shame and neither do you. If you're a child of God, you're free from sin. Your sins are forgiven. <sighs> you may ask why mankind does not simply receive the free gift of salvation. John 1 12. And the answer is that Satan, the God of this world, has tempted mankind to follow his pride instead. Satan sets the agenda. The unbelieving world follows and mankind continues to be deceived. 
It's no wonder that scripture calls Satan a liar. John 8, 44. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 5-11, through 11, the Apostle Paul addresses the issue of a man who had committed a sin so grave that it affected the whole body of believers. After the man underwent some form of correction prescribed by Paul and carried out by the church, Paul now believes the discipline had been effective. He urges the believers in Corinth to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, verse 7, and to reaffirm their love for the sinner. One reason Paul gave for ending the punishment and forgiving the man was to prevent Satan from outsmarting them and taking advantage of the situation, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul recognizes that Satan is clever and cunning and that believers need to be aware of his schemes. Um, the Greek term translated as devices in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 is alternately rendered designs and schemes in some translations. Now, Satan's devices are the evil intentions and plans he thinks up to oppose God and his people. And make no mistake, he wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. Don't let him do it. Um, this passage is not the only time that Paul draws the Corinthians' attention to Satan and his clever devices. Um, see 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and chapter 6, verse 15, and chapter 12, verse 7. Um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, Paul warns married couples not to deprive one another of sexual intimacy for too long, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He also mentions Satan's capacity to disguise himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14. Um, by forgiving the man who had sinned, the Corinthians would exercise wisdom rather than be ignorant of Satan's devices. Forgiveness would restore unity in the church and prevent Satan from taking advantage of any division. It would also deprive Satan of an opportunity to discourage or defeat the man through excessively long and drawn out punishment. And um, likewise, it would keep the church members from hardening their hearts towards the man. The division that we're seeing today in the church and in, well, I want to say in the body of Christ is because of Satan. Um, and I don't want to say that completely because I liken it to the wheat and the tares. We're, we're seeing great divisions everywhere, all around us, in every, in the world, in the church, everywhere. Um, and I believe that's because the harvest is ready. Jesus is coming soon. And the wheat and tares are being sorted. We are being sorted right now. Stand up strong in your faith. The Bible presents numerous examples of Satan's schemes. As the enemy of God, the devil is constantly working against God. His purposes and his people um, he's working against us. Uh, the apostle Peter strongly advised, uh, believers to beware of Satan's devices. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. First Peter chapter five, verses eight through nine. One of Satan's devices is to accuse believers of their past sins. Revelation 12, verse 10, Zechariah uh, chapter 3, 1 through 2. Thankfully, Satan's accusations are baseless and powerless against those who are forgiven and redeemed by Jesus Christ, who canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Colossians chapter 2, 14 through 15. And this can include sins that you're involved in now. You may have sinned today. You probably did. Satan will use everything he can against you. But you're a child of God and um, God knew you were going to sin. You will not lose your salvation. Don't let him fool you. We all make mistakes. We feel bad for it. We, we go to God and we ask for spiritual guidance. We ask the Spirit to guide us and protect us and keep us from evil. And we repent. We tell God we're sorry. And you know what? You've probably sinned sins that you didn't even know you committed. But God knows you. He's not going to let you go. Um, another of Satan's devices is to tempt Christians to sin and fall away from fellowship with God. When you sin, 
it, you feel shame and you don't want to go to the Father and you distance yourself thinking that Jesus wouldn't want to see you this way. But remember, Jesus died for you while we were still sinners. He died for you 2,000 years ago. He knew everything you were going to do. Jesus warned his disciples that Satan would try to sift each of you like wheat. Luke 22, 31. From the beginning, Satan has tried to lure and seduce people to put God to the test. Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 5. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 9. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 10. Good one. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. A favorite device of Satan is deceit, for he is a liar and the father of lies, and there is no truth in him. Um, John eight forty four, We can resist Satan's uh, deceitfulness by knowing the truth of God's word in the depth of our being. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, the Lord responded to each direct attack with the word of God. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Scripture is our most potent weapon against uh, Satan's devices. Now Satan also wants to discredit those um, the scriptures. He wants to twist them. He wants to change them. He tried it with Jesus. He will try it with you. Stand firm. Read the Bible. This is why it's so important to know the scriptures. This is why it's so important to be in the word of God. It's more important than you can imagine. Um, Satan has a way of making sin attractive, but we can resist his temptation if we prepare our minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all of our hope in the gracious salvation that will come to us when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. 1 Peter 1.13 uh, Jesus is our high priest who understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same um, testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 And see also Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Christians must not be ignorant of Satan's devices, but be vigilant and ready for action. We can. We can absolutely 100% rely on God's faithfulness in times of testing and temptation. Um, we can be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 12. Read it. Get to know it. Memorize it. Um, and we can do as Jesus commanded. Keep watch and pray, so that you will not give into temptation, for the spirit is willing, willing, but the body is weak. Matthew 26, 41. We go to God with everything. Everything. He is um He's listening and He will hear you and He will help you. Um, it is crucial that every Christian understands that he or she is in a spiritual battle. We are all in a spiritual battle battle. There is no way to get out of it. Awareness of the spiritual battle around us is very important. Not only awareness, but vigilance, preparedness, uh, courage, and the right weaponry are crucial elements of engaging in spiritual welfare. In the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It is clear that our warfare as Christians is spiritual. We are not fighting a physical battle or a human battle. It is on a spiritual level. Its enemies, its prerogatives, its fortresses, and its weapons are all spiritual. If we attempt to fight the spiritual with human weapons, we will fail and the enemy will be victorious. It is important to note that Paul is not speaking about battling demons here. When Jesus and the apostles cast demons out, it was along um, with the other signs and wonders they exhibited, primarily to prove the authority of what they said. It was important at that time for God to give the apostles a powerful proof that they were indeed from God and were his spokesmen, his power to authenticate their teachings. The point all along was to show that the ultimate authority and our ultimate spiritual weapon is scripture. 
the kind of spiritual battle that every Christian engages in is primary, primarily a battle of the mind and heart. The spiritual battle is quite personal for each Christian. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking to devour, and we must remain vigilant against him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, The enemy of our soul has flaming arrows that can only be distinguished by the shield of faith as handled by a believer equipped with the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 17, Jesus told us, watch and pray so as not to fall into temptation. Mark 14, 38, so according to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, there are spiritual fortresses um, in this world made of speculations and lofty things. The word speculations is in the Greek logismos. logismos. Um, it means ideas, concepts, reasonings, philosophies. People of the world build up these um, logismos to protect themselves against the truth of God. Sadly, these fortresses often become prisons and eventually tombs. As Christians, we have a calling to break down these fortresses and rescue the inhabitants. It is dangerous and difficult work, but we have a divine arsenal always at our disposal. Unfortunately, one of the enemy's best tricks is getting us to fight with human weapons rather than the divine. When fighting against worldly philosophies, humans, human wit and weaponry are of no avail. Marketing techniques, counter-philosophies, persuasive words of human wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2.4, rationalism, organization, skill, entertainment, mystique, better lighting, better music, these are all human weapons. None of these things will win the spiritual war. The only thing that is effective, the only offensive weapon we possess is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6.17. This sword gives us many freedoms as soldiers in the spiritual battle. We have freedom from fear, knowing that God is fighting for us. Joshua chapter 1, 7 through 9, and that he will not forsake us. We have freedom from guilt, knowing that we are not responsible for the souls of those who reject God's message after we have proclaimed it to them. Mark chapter 6, verse 11. We have freedom from despair, knowing that if we are persecuted and hated, Christ was persecuted and hated first. John 15, verse 18, and that our battle wounds will be richly and lovingly tended to in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. All of these freedoms come from using the powerful weapon of God, his word. If we use human weaponry to fight the temptations of the wicked one, we will sustain failures and disappointment. Um, conversely, the, vic the victories of God are full of hope. Let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews chapter 10, 22 through 23. The hearts of those who hear and accept the true, full message of the gospel as given by the apostles are sprinkled clean and washed with pure water. What is this water? It is the word of God that strengthens us as we fight. Ephesians chapter 5, 26 and John 7, 38. The Bible teaches the existence of immaterial, spiritual reality, unseen by human eyes. The physical reality is evident, um, is evident for all to see, although some doubt the, ex um, the existence of a material universe too. The Bible says that the spiritual realm consists of both good, God and the holy angels, and evil, the devil and his demons. Demons are most likely fallen angels who rebelled against God and were thrown out of heaven. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 17, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Um, I also think that demons um, very well could be the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood. The giants, um, they weren't supposed to exist. There was no place for them. So now they're without their bodies, but they're waiting judgment. I mean, it's a possibility, and that's just one of my own thoughts. Um, but the Bible teaches that humans were created by God in his image, which means we have sp a spiritual component. Genesis 1, We are more than physical entities. We possess a soul, a spirit destined for eternity. Even though the spiritual realm is invisible to the physical eye, we are connected to it. And what goes on in the spiritual realm directly affects our physical world. In our culture, 
uh, the most commonly accepted form of evidence for proving the existence of something is empirical evidence, which involves using the scientific method of observation and experimentation. Um, is there empirical evidence for a spiritual realm? It doesn't take much research before one realizes that there is evidence both for and against the existence of a spiritual realm. It comes down to which study one wants to believe. Uh, aliens. They're not from another planet. They're demons from another um, dimension. Um, the best and most prevalent evidence available proving that there is a spiritual realm is testimonial evidence. We can look at the sheer number of religions around the world and the billions of people who focus their lives on the spiritual realm. Is it likely that so many people would report encounters with the spiritual and it not be real? The best testimonial evidence for a spiritual realm is the Bible itself. Historians, both Christian and non-Christian, agree that the historical authenticity of the Bible is strong. Jesus um, claimed to be God's son, the one who came down from heaven. He made this fact quite clear. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. John 8, 23. The Bible recounts numerous encounters that people had with um, the spiritual realm. Jesus cast demons out of people regularly, healed the sick by speaking to them, miraculously fed thousands of people, and spoke with people who should be dead. Moses and Elijah. Matthew 17, 1 through 3. These are all indicators that the spiritual realm is real. The phrase full armor of God comes from Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6.12 clearly indicates that the conflict with Satan is spiritual, and therefore no tangible weapons can be effectively employed against him and his minions. Um, we are not given a list of specific tactics Satan will use. However, the passage is quite clear that when we follow the instruction faithfully, we will be able to stand, and we will have victory regardless of state, Satan's strategy. Um, I have to take a quick pause here. Uh, my leg, which has blood clots in it, is turning red and very hard, and I need to move, keep the blood flowing. Um, remember to pray for me. I am never turning down prayers. In fact, I would really appreciate them. Um, but I'm going to take a quick break here. I'll be back before you even can say rapture. Okay, I'm back. Um, so... Yes, before you ask, um, I am on my blood thinners, I'm taking my medications, I'm doing everything the doctor told me, um, but my, um, I have to get up once in a while and I have to walk because I have to keep the blood flow going. The clot hasn't, the clots haven't, they're very big, they go from my hip to my knee. They do not um, block off the blood flow completely, but if I don't move around, I don't want to, you know, it could get worse, but my body has to break down the clots. Um, while the blood thinners are supposed to keep them from getting worse. So um, I'm now sideways. I've changed my position and that's because I'm going to elevate this leg while we while I finish the study that I have for you. Um, I have a few more points to make, um, but we are getting towards the end. Um, we're going to talk about the armor, the full armor of God. We're going to talk about um, the crowns that are promised to us, our rewards in heaven, and we're going to talk about, um, are we in the last days? How do we know we're in the last days? And, um, that's about all, um, what I have left for you, um, for this study tonight. And then I'm going to go rest and go to work again tomorrow, and I will upload this video, which you'll be watching today, because I'll have uploaded it today. So, um, I hope that I can, you can still hear me okay, and I'm going to just continue um, with this study and um, take breaks as you need. Pause it. Come back to the video. I very much appreciate your views because YouTube is, can kind of be a jerk to me. They like to not, um, they like to not, not um, 
how do I say it? They're not like, like I'll have more likes than they'll let me have. Like there'll be like 12 people who will like a video and they'll only give me four. So, um, it is what it is, but, uh, if you need to take breaks, take breaks, um, watch, listen while you can come back to it later. So, um, the first element of our armor is truth. Ephesians chapter six, verse 14. Um, this belt immediately sets believers apart from the world since Satan is the father of lies. John 8, 44. Deception is high, high on the list of things God considers to be an abomination. A lying tongue is one of the things he describes as detestable to him. Proverbs 6, 16 through 17. We are therefore exhorted to put on truth for our own sanctification and deliverance, as well as for the benefit of those to whom we witness. How much truth are you finding in the world today? Everyone is lying to you. The news media is lying to you. The politicians are lying to you. The leaders are lying to you. They're lying about everything. You need to wear the belt of truth. You need to stand strong and firm in the gospel, the Bible. What it says is truth. Jesus is the truth. And there's no other truth. Um, also in verse 14, we are told to put on the breastplate of righteousness. A breastplate shielded a warrior's vital organs from blows that would otherwise be fatal. This righteousness, it is, it's not works of righteousness done by men. Rather, this is the righteousness of Christ, imputed by God and received by faith, with, which, which guards our hearts against the accusations and charges of Satan and secures our innermost um, being from his attacks. You do not have to live in shame. You are righteous through Jesus Christ because he did it all on the cross and his righteousness covers yours, covers your sins. You're free from your sins. Now verse 15 speaks of the preparation of the feet of spiritual conflict, um, the preparation of the gospel, your sandal, the, the, um, the sandals or um, is the gospel of Jesus. Um, in warfare, sometimes an enemy places dangerous obstacles in the path of advancing soldiers. And the, the idea of preparation of the gospel of peace is that we need to advance into Satan's territory, aware that there will be traps. The message of grace is essential to winning souls to Christ, and we must be prepared with the gospel. Satan has many, many obstacles placed in the path to halt the, pro the progression of the gospel, and one of his ways is distraction to distract everyone from the message that you're trying to give by twisting scriptures, turning, changing the scriptures, arguing to the point where nobody even wants to read, nobody even wants to know what the original um, gospel that you're giving them is. <sighs> Satan will put many obstacles in your way. Be aware of them. Um, the shield of faith in verse 16, can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. When we bear the shield of faith, Satan can cast all the aspirations, uh, doubt, and dismay that he wants, um, but they will be ineffective. Our faith, of which Christ is the author and perfecter, Hebrews 12, 2, is like a shield, solid and substantial. The helmet of salvation in verse 17 is protection for the head, keeping safe a critical part of the body. We could say that our way of thinking needs preservation. Preservation. Um, the head is the seat of the mind, which when it has laid hold of the sure hope of eternal life, will not receive false doctrine or give way to Satan's temptations. The unsaved person has no hope of warding off the blows of false doctrine because he is without the helmet of salvation and his mind is incapable of discerning between spiritual truth and spiritual deception. You can know that you are saved. What it, You put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and you are saved and nobody can take that away. Nobody. And you need to know that and, and be confident in it. 
there is a confidence that comes with wearing that, uh, the helmet of salvation. Now, verse 17 interprets the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God. This is our only offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. That's how powerful this is. Everything else is defensive. This is offensive. You've got an offensive weapon, and it's the only one we've been given, which is why um, the world hates the Bible and wants to um, ban it. Now, yes, it's true that in these days we're seeing that many states, there's several states have, what, three or four states have um, now made it, um, the Bible must be um, kept in the schools in certain states, and they must be taught in the schools. Um, that sounds wonderful, and it is a great victory, but but um, don't get too excited. I mean, yeah, it's exciting, but who's teaching the Bible? Non-believers? How are they going to use it? Are they going to twist it? We don't know how that's playing out, but we're in the last days, so I wouldn't trust in that. Um, but... <sighs> The sword of the spirit is the word of God, while all other pieces of spiritual armor are for defense. The, the sword of the spirit allows us to take the offense. The sword analogy speaks to the holiness and power of the word of God. There is no greater spiritual weapon. In Jesus' temptations in the desert, the word of God was always his overpowering response to Satan. Um, and that is such a blessing that the same word is available to us. God has made the the Bible, the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Um, he's made it available for every generation. You can trust your Bible. Um, in verse 18, we are told to pray in the Spirit, that is, with the mind of Christ, with his heart and his priorities, in addition to wearing the full armor of God. We cannot neglect prayer as it is the means by which we draw spiritual strength from God. Without prayer, without reliance upon God, our efforts at spiritual warfare are empty and futile. The full armor of God, truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God, and prayer are the tools God has given us through which we can be spiritually victorious. Satan is a defeated foe. He's been defeated. Um, so don't let um, Satan tear you down. You're a child of God. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if your trust and your faith is in him and in him alone, not in good deeds, not in works, you're, you're saved and secured. You're sealed. Don't let Satan tear you down. Be confident in it. Now, how do I know that we're in the end days? Well, the Bible prophecies um, pro um, prophesizes of many events that will occur in the end times and um, we're seeing the beginning of these now. And if we're seeing the beginning and the setup of the tribulation, then we know that the rapture is very near. Uh, the Bible tells us when you see these things begin to happen, look up because your redemption is near. We're leaving very soon. We see all these things happening. So I do want to get into that just a little bit. Um, these events can be categorized as natural signs, spiritual signs, sociological signs, technological signs and political signs. Um, we can look to what the Bible says about these things. And if the signs are present in abundance, we can be certain that we are in fact living in the end times. Now Luke 21 11 lists some of the natural signs that will occur before Jesus' second coming. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. While we shouldn't interpret every natural disaster as a sign of the end times, an increase in natural disasters seems to be a warm-up to what is coming next, birth pangs, as Jesus called them in Matthew 24, 8. Um, the Bible lists both positive and negative spiritual signs. In 2 Timothy 4, 3-4, we discover that many people will follow false teachers. We see now an increase in cultic groups, heresy, deception, blasphemy, and occultism, with many choosing to follow New Age or pagan religions or religions that um, condone their sins. Um, on the positive side, Joel 2, 28-29 prophesies that there will be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
And Joel's prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 16. And we are still seeing the effects of that outpouring in revivals and spirit-led Christian movements and in the worldwide preaching of the gospel message. We're not seeing it as much here in America, but um, other countries are experiencing it. Um, like I said, we're, we're at the end. Don't expect large revivals um, now because the rapture is coming. And I believe the biggest revival will be after the, the day of the rapture. There's going to be a huge revival the day of the rapture. Make no mistake about that. So along with the signs in the natural and spiritual realms, there are signs in society. Oh, did I, I also forgot to mention the dreams and visions that people are having all over the world. People are having a lot of dreams and visions. So, um, or at least dreams. I don't know necessarily about visions. Um, but um, along with those signs, there's also signs in society. And the immorality rampant in society today is a symptom of mankind's rebellion against God, abortion, homosexuality, drug abuse, the alphabet people. Child molesters are proof that evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse. Second Timothy 3.13 And we are now living in a um, hedonistic and materialistic society. People are lovers of themselves, looking out for number one and doing what is right in their own eyes. All these things and many more can be seen around us every day. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 4. People don't want God anymore. They want to be God. They believe that they are God. It's insane um, what we're seeing today. And it's, become, it's increasing more frequent. The fulfillment of some end time prophecies seem impossible. Um, seemed impossible until the advent of modern technology. Some of the judgments in Revelation are more easily imagined in a nuclear age. Isaiah 17, Jeremiah 49, Revelation 13, the Antichrist is said to control commerce by forcing people to take the mark of the beast. And given today's advances in computer chip technology, uh, the tools he will use may very well be here already and I believe they absolutely are. CBDCs, the ch um, the RDIF chips, the um, they've got, what is it, like this tattoo thing that they can put on you. There's there's a lot of things they can do there. Um, and although um, through the internet, radio, television, the gospel can, um, social media, big time, the gospel can now be proclaimed to the entire world. Mark 13, 10, and it is being proclaimed to the entire world. Um, if you have the internet, all you have to do, I mean, it's, it, it's there. It's, it's out there. The world can now hear the gospel. It's not like you have to go um, traipsing through a jungle to reach people. Although in some cases, missionaries are still doing that. Um, but there's also the political signs. The restoration of Israel to her land in 1948 is the single most impressive, fulfilled prophecy proving that we live in the end times. At the turn of the 20th century, no one would have dreamed that Israel would be back in her land, let alone occupying Jerusalem. Jerusalem is definitely at the center of geopolitics and stands alone against many enemies. Zechariah 12.3 confirms this. On that day, when the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All to, who try to move it will injure themselves. Matthew 24, 6-7 predicted that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Wars and rumors of wars are definitely characteristic of this present age. Look at what's happening in Israel now. They are at war. The world wants to divide them, give them a two-state solution. They want to give their enemies a state, the Palestine, Palestinians, a, a two-state two solution. They're fighting like on seven fronts. And the world seems to be blaming them when they weren't even to blame. They were attacked. Um, look at what's happened in Israel. Watch Israel because that just shows you how close we are to the tribulation, which means we're even that much closer to the rapture. Um, these are just a few of the signs that we're living in the end of the age. There are many, many more. 
God gives us these um, prophecies because he does not want anyone to perish, and he always gives ample warning before pouring out his wrath. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Um, so are we living in the end times? We're seeing a convergence of prophecies that we've never seen before. We have the technology that we've never had before. No one knows when Jesus will return, but the rapture could occur at any moment. God will deal with sin, either by grace or by wrath. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Those who do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior will remain under the Lord's wrath. And the good news is that it's not too late to choose eternal life. All that is required is acceptance by faith of God's free gift of grace. There is nothing you can do to earn grace. Jesus has paid the price for you. Romans 3.24 I hope that you're ready to um, for the Lord's return. Um, or are you planning to hang out here on earth and experience his wrath? I don't recommend it. Um, but we are told to watch. And Jesus uses the phrase watch and pray on a couple of different occasions. Once was the night before the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus took his disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed that this cup be taken from me. Matthew 26, 39. After the prayer, he found his disciples sleeping. He was grieved that he was grieved that they could not even pray with him for an hour and warned them to watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Another occurrence of the phrase watch and pray is found earlier in Jesus' ministry when he prophesied about the end times. Luke chapter 21 details many of those events. And Jesus warned that they would happen suddenly. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed, um, weighed down with kerosene, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Luke 21, 34. He then says, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. They were, he's, we're going to escape all that is about to happen. And we're going to be standing in front of the Son of Man. Watch and pray. The word translated watch means to have alertness of a guard at night. A night watchman must be even more vigilant than a daytime guard. In the daytime, danger can be spotted from a distance. But in the night, everything is different. A night watchman must use senses other than the sight to detect danger. He is often alone in the darkness and without the defenses he would otherwise employ. There may be no indication of enemy attack until it happens. So he must be hypervigilant, suspecting, um, suspecting it at any moment. That is the type of watching Jesus spoke about. Jesus warned us that we are too easy, if we are too easily distracted by the physical, we will be caught unaware if we do not continually discipline ourselves. In the Garden of Gethsemane, sleepiness overcame the disciples. Their physical need overpowered their desire to obey him. He was grieved when he saw this, knowing what was ahead for them. If they did not remain spiritually vigilant, in tune with him, John 15, 5, um, and ready to deny the flesh, they would be overcome by the evil one. 1 Peter 5, 8. Jesus' disciples today must also watch and pray. We are easily distracted by this world. Oh, man, every news um, article is a distraction. It's, we're being distracted by everything. Our fleshly needs and desires and the schemes of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 2.11 When we take our eyes from Jesus and his soon return, our values begin to shift. Our attention wanders. And soon we're living in the world and bearing little fruit for God's kingdom. 1 Timothy 6, 18-19 He warned us that we must be ready at any moment to stand before him and give account an account of our lives. Romans 14, 12 uh, 1 Peter 4, 5 Matthew 12, 36 Watch and pray. We can only remain faithful when we are devoted to prayer. In prayer, we continually allow God to forgive us, cleanse us, teach us, and strengthen us to obey him. He gives us strength and peace and joy. He's our Father. We, we must maintain a relationship with Him to feel 
um, so that we don't fall into the traps of Satan, so that we feel our close connection with our Father. In order to keep watch, we must pray for endurance and freedom from distractions. Hebrews 12, 2, Luke 18, 1, Ephesians 6, 18. We must pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. When we live with eager expectation of the Lord's return and expect persecution until then, because uh, we're going to have persecution, that's not the tribulation. There will be trials. There will be tribulation. The tribulation is the seven-year tribulation. That's different. Um, there is going to always be suffering on this earth until Jesus is here and reigning over the earth. Um, but we are more likely to keep our lives pure and our hearts ready to meet him if we're in prayer with him. Uh, which brings me to my last um, bit that I want to share with you, and that is our rewards. I want to um, end this on a very high note. Um, the Bible mentions rewards in heaven multiple times. Matthew 5.12, Luke 6.23 uh, Luke 35, verse 1, um, 1 Corinthians 3, 14, and 9, 18. So, why would I, why are we looking for rewards? Do we, why are rewards even necessary? I mean, being in heaven with God, wouldn't that be enough? Experiencing him, his glory, and the joys of heaven will be so wonderful. It's hard to understand why extra rewards would be needed. Also, since our faith rests in Christ's righteousness instead of our own, Romans 3, 21 through 26, it seems strange that our works would merit reward. But God will give rewards in heaven at the Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ, based on our faithfulness in service to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. The rewards will show the reality of our sonship, Galatians 4, 7, and the justice of God, Hebrews 6, 10. God will give rewards in heaven in order to fulfill the law of sowing and reaping, Galatians 6, 7 through 9, and make good on his promise that our labor in the Lord is not in vain, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. One reason for the rewards in heaven is the fact that Jesus shares his reward with us. Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Our lives are hidden with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4. Uh, we die with him, and we live with him, and we share in his joy. Romans 6, 8. Matthew 25.21 in heaven, we will dwell with him. John 14, 1 through 3. Our lives are inextricably linked with Christ's. The reward he receives is shared with all of us. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Romans 8, 17. Our rewards in heaven depend on the goodness and power of God. Through Christ's resurrection, we gain an inheritance in heaven. On earth, our faith is tested and results in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. 1 Peter 1, 3-9 The things we do in this life are only permanent, that is, um, are the only permanent, you know, care, things that we carry with us into heaven if they are built on the foundation, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11-15 so the rewards we gain in um, heaven are not like the rewards we earn here on earth. We tend to think in material items, mansions, jewels, etc. But these things are only representations of the true rewards that we will gain in heaven. A child who wins a spelling bee treasures, um, who wins a spelling bee treasures, the trophy he receives, not for the sake of the trophy itself, but what, but for what the trophy means. Likewise, any reward or honor we gain in heaven will be precious to us because they carry the weight and meaning of our relationship with God and because they remind us of what he did through us on earth. In this way, uh, rewards in heaven glorify God and provide us with joy, peace, and wonder as we consider God's work in and through us. The closer we were to God during this life, the more centered on him and aware of him, the more dependent on him, um, the more desperate 
for his mercy, um, the more there will be to celebrate. We are like characters in a story who suffer doubt, loss, fear, wondering if we will ever really have our heart's desires. When the happy ending comes and desire is fulfilled, there comes a completion. The story would not be satisfying without the completion. Rewards in heaven are the completion of our earthly story, and those rewards will be eternally satisfying. Psalm 16, 11. So there are five heavenly crowns mentioned in the New Testament that will be awarded to believers. Um, they are the imperishable crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and the crown of life. I consider the crown of life to be the most hardcore crown. Um, a lot of our tribulation saints, they're going to be getting the crown of life because they will have been beheaded for their faith. Um, that is the most hardcore crown in my opinion, um, but I may be proven wrong when I get there. We'll see. Um, maybe they're more hardcore than I ever thought um, because this world isn't easy. Um, it, there's, there's nothing easy about um, about being a Christian. Don't if you if you want an easy life, the Christian life is not for you. But the rewards are endless. Um, the Greek word translated crown is Stephanos, uh, the source of the name Stephen the martyr, um, and means a badge of royalty, a prize in the public games, or a symbol of honor generally. Used during ancient Greek um, games, it's referred to a wreath or garland of leaves placed on the victor's head as a reward for winning an athletic contest. Um, as such, this word is used figuratively in the New Testament of the rewards of heaven God promised those who are faithful. Paul's passage in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25 best defines how these crowns are awarded. So number one is the, we'll talk about the imperishable, perishable crown first. 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 24 through 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, disciplined, um, in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. All things on this earth are subject to decay and will perish. Jesus urges us not to store our treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, Matthew six nineteen. This is an analogous to what Paul was saying about that wreath of leaves that was soon to turn brittle and fall apart, but not so the heavenly crown. Faithful endurance wins a heavenly reward, which is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 1.4 um, The second crown is the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 for what is our hope or joy or a crown of rejoicing? It is, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4.4 4, to rejoice always in the Lord for all the bountiful blessings our gracious God has showed upon us. As Christians, we have more in this life to rejoice about than anyone else. Luke tells us there is rejoicing even now in heaven, Luke 15, 7. The crown of rejoicing will be our reward, where God will wipe away every tear. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, um, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. Now, number three is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Are you, or are you holding on to the world? We inherit this crown through the righteousness of Christ, which is what gives us a right to it, and without which it cannot be obtained because it is obtained and possessed in a righteous way and not by force and deceit as earthly crowns sometimes are. It is an everlasting crown.
promised to all who love the Lord and eagerly wait for his return. Though our enduring discouragements, persecution, suffering, or even death, we know assuredly our reward is with Christ in eternity. Philippians 3.20 This crown is not for those who depend upon their own sense of righteousness or their own works. Such an attitude breeds only arrogance and pride, not a longing and fervent desire to be with the Lord. Number four would be the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5.4 And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Though Peter is addressing the elders, we must also remember that the crown will be awarded to all those who long for or love his appearing. This word glory is an interesting word, referring to the very nature of God and his actions. It entails his great splendor and brightness. Uh, recall Stephen, who, while being stoned to death, was able to look into the heavens and see the glory of God. Acts 7, 55-56 um, this word also means that the praise and honor we bestow to God alone is due him because of who he is. <laughs> There's a moth in here somewhere. Um, but Isaiah 42 verse 8 and chapter 48 verse 11 and Galatians chapter 1 verse 5. Uh, it also recognizes that believers are incredibly blessed to enter into the kingdom, into the very likeness of Christ himself. For as Paul so eloquently put it, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, verse 18. And then we've got the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. This crown is for all believers, but is especially dear to those who endure suffering, who bravely confront persecution for Jesus, even to the point of death. In scripture, the word life is often used to show a relationship that is right with God. Um, it was Jesus who said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10, just as things, um, just as things such as air, food, uh, water are vital for our physical lives, Jesus provides us for what is required for um, our spiritual lives. He is the one who provides living water. He is the bread of life. John four, verse ten, and John six, verse thirty-five. We know that our earthly lives will end, but we have an amazing promise that comes only to those who come to God through Jesus. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life, 1 John 2, 25. So James tells us that this crown of life is for, um, is for all those who love God, James 1, 12. The question then is, how do we demonstrate our love for God? The apostle, um, sorry, the apostle John answers this for us, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3. As his children, we must keep his commandments, obeying him, always remaining faithful. So as we endure the, um, the inevitable trials, pains, heartaches, and tribulations, as long as we live, may we ever move forward, always looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2. And receive the crown of life that awaits us. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7. This is one of the better known and most quoted passages of the Apostle Paul. These words written just before Paul's death are a powerful affirmation of his undying love and undying faith in Jesus and the gospel message. Galatians 1, verse 4. Um... Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. The word translated kept means to keep by guarding, to watch over. The Greek word for faith is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I which has to do with the conviction based on hearing, uh, Romans 10, 17. Paul's trust in Jesus never wavered. His faith was as solid on the day of his death as it had been the moment he first believed on the Damascus road. 
Acts 9, 3. He was firm in his faith in the midst of the mob's violence in Acts 16, 22 and 2 Corinthians 11, 25 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. He stood uncompromising before the um, digent, um, digentries, uh, Felix. Acts 22, verse 10 and uh, 22. Um, Festus, Acts 25, verse 9. And Agrippa, Acts 25, verse 26. He boldly confronted Peter when that apostle showed signs of compromising the teachings of Christ in Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 16. The expression, I have kept the faith, has two possible meanings. One is that Paul had faithfully declared the gospel and guarded its truth, keeping its message unadulterated. And elsewhere, Paul called this the pattern of sound teaching and encouraged Timothy to keep it as well in 2 Timothy 1, 13. Um, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. The other possible meaning of I have kept the faith is that Paul had fulfilled his divine appointment in this world. Um, in other words, that he would be Jesus' messenger to the Gentiles. Acts 9, 15 and Acts 22, 21. When Jesus commissioned Paul, he was clear that the appointment would mean much suffering Acts 9, 16, but Paul gladly accepted the summons and never wavered in his commitment, trusting that he would soon experience an eternal glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, keeping the faith is never easy. Without question, Satan sought to derail Paul's work by opposing him far and wide. There were Galatian legalists, um, Colossian Gnostics, and Judaizers, Judaizers at every turn. Um, they were forged. There were forged letters, Second Thessalonians chapter two verse two. There were slanderous attacks on his integrity, his personal appearance, and his unpolished speech, Second Corinthians ten ten, Second Corinthians one six. Not to mention the physical beatings he took, Second Corinthians eleven twenty three through twenty seven. Um, he was truly hard pressed on every side, Second um, Corinthians four eight. He was truly truly hard pressed. Um, Paul's faith was the victory. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.12 What God had committed to Paul, Paul committed back to God. And through it all, Paul looked forward to the movement when he would hear the Lord say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25.21 That's what I want to hear. As believers in Christ, we too should keep the faith. What has God called you to do? Do it with all your might. Colossians 3.23 Just as Paul longed for his appearing and anticipated receiving the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8, so should we serve the Lord and faithfully fulfill his plan for our lives. Revelation 4.10-11 is part of the vision Jesus gave John in um, this scene in heaven we see that the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Jesus promised various rewards for those who faithfully serve him on earth. Um, some of those rewards are crowns. The, these may be crowns that John saw the elders lay at the feet of Jesus. In their words of worship, they indicate that uh, despite what they may have done on earth to earn these crowns, only Jesus is truly worthy of glory and honor. In the presence of the Lord Jesus himself, all good deeds we have done will pale in comparison. A crown will seem but an insignificant gift to present to the one who gave um, his life for us. Galatians 2 verse 20, but I... I would like to have the crown to lay at his feet in honor of his great glory and majesty. Um, the elder's response is most likely the way we will all respond when we receive our reward from Jesus. We will be so overcome with gratitude because of what he, um, what he has done for us that worship will be spontaneous regardless of what we endured here on earth. A priceless crown will seem a paltry offering, but it will be the best gift that we can give him. Although the scriptures do not state it specifically, it is likely that we will all follow the example of the 24 elders in casting our crowns at Jesus' feet.
are you going to just hold on to your crown um, knowing that it was Christ who worked through you and that it was because of Jesus Christ that you even have that crown? You would never have gotten, you, you can't earn it. Jesus did it all for you on the cross. There's nothing that you can do to earn anything. We are wretched, sinful beings. Um, but we are children of God. We are redeemed by Jesus' blood. If you put your faith and your trust in him and him alone, um, there's a lot of false teachers out there. There's a lot of people out there twisting the scriptures. There's a lot of people trying to trip you up, trying to change your mind to their way of thinking. When my source is the Bible, um, they will use the Bible. That's why it's so important that you know your scriptures and that you understand them so that you cannot be deceived. Um, the truth doesn't change. It was the same when in the beginning. It's the same now. Another thing that people like to say is that the Bible is um, tampered with. It's been, it's, it's not the correct translation. It's not the word of God. It's, um, don't fall into it. You know what? Most of those people saying that, that are attacking the Bible, they're not even reading any translation. King James, Greek, Hebrew. They're not reading any NIV, whatever they're attacking. They, they're not even reading it at all. What difference does it make to argue which translation is correct when they're not even reading the translation that they consider correct? They say that none of it's correct. It's all corrupted. It's not true. The Bible tells us that um, the word of God is active and alive and sharper than a two-edged sword. And um, God promised that he would keep, um, that, that the word of God would be available for every generation. So don't buy into it. Your Bible is fine. Read it. Um, I Like I said, I like to have more than one translation. But don't just um, let Satan push you around and twist the scriptures and tell you this means this and that means that. And um, I'm sorry, but this isn't here. The Bible needs to be taken in whole. Um, the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And the New Testament points to Jesus Christ. They both do. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So all scripture is important and it's important for you to know it. Um, so I hope that um, this helps any of you um, encourages any of you who are struggling in this very dark world, you let your lights shine, um, keep oil in your lamp and don't, don't worry. Um, if they don't believe you, if they don't listen to you, if they harass you, there's always, I mean, if they're not hearing you, there's a reason for that. The Holy Spirit is not in them. Now, if you're preaching, if you're the one out there preaching a false gospel or a false teaching, um, you know, always, always look to scripture is what you're telling people the truth. Is it what God says? Is it there in the Bible or are you willfully ignoring it and choosing to ignore it or to put your own take on um, your own spin on it because, because, um, you want it to fit your agenda. Don't do that. Don't take scripture out of context. Um, if the Bible says it, it's true. And almost all of scripture can be taken literally. It will tell you if it's uh, symbolic because um, it'll say, you know, um, I like um, when the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. It wasn't saying that the Holy Spirit was a dove descending on Jesus. It said like a dove. It tells you when it's symbolic. And um, as you read your Bible, you'll start to pick that up. If it says like something, it's sim it's more of a symbolic because it's more of a symbolic picture of it. But if it doesn't say, you know, like, but it's, it, it, it's probably, you can probably take it literally. So I'm going to say good night and God bless you and keep you. And if you do not have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you're not, your faith and trust isn't in him and him alone. Please, please, I beg you, get to know him because you're running out of time. Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, it's getting dark out there. Keep oil in your lamps, and don't worry. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's coming, and he's coming soon. I want to see you in heaven.